get to see. So it's a, it's a pleasure. And uh, I would certainly like to have this as a discussion. So if you have any questions or any inputs, it's not about getting from the beginning to the end. I will also be writing on the screen so that it's more interactive. So uh, whatever interests you, I would like to hear about that. So yes, in Baltzar did hook me up into looking at uh, topological dynamics from a certain point of view, which includes uh, ultra filters and then more generally filters. And uh, it's been fruitful. So I've been doing that for a while now. So yeah, I'm sorry if I repeat something, but this is a, this is a project that um, part of it finished uh, recently. And um, there is still a lot of questions as you will see. And uh, um, it's mostly about non metrizable dynamics, where one of the reasons that there is questions is that nobody is interested in non metrizable dynamics. Everybody does metrizable spaces. But uh, I think that we can understand better the metrizable ones when we don't, and we, when we understand the more general ones as well. So um, please, if you get interested, I think that the uh, set theorists could do something in there as well. So, oh my, does it fit? Let me see if I can. Looks like it doesn't fit on the screen. Which um, view? Let's do this. That might be a little better. No. Interesting. That's never happened to me before, and I was teaching the whole semester on uh, online. Maybe it's the different app. Anyway, so a little intro into topological dynamics. So we are talking about arbitrary topological groups, but we are restricting ourselves to compact house door spaces which makes our life a lot easier and we will typically be talking about flows which means that we will be talking all together about the topological group the compact house or space and a specific action right so the same group could have different actions on the same space so uh, we will be ambiguous with saying just the space is a g flow but really that also contains the action where actions need to be continuous in our case and uh, we are acting by uh, homeomorphisms. So we have uh, that the identity acts as the identity homeomorphism. And if we are looking at multiplication, then uh, that works as composition and we can first evaluate it by one homeomorphism and then by the other. So to another viewpoint is really by looking at uh, a continuous homomorphism from the group into the group of homeomorphisms. And the correct topology for that to be really the same thing is the compact open topology on the homeomorphism group, right? So I take an element uh, G in the group and I um, assign to it a permutation from X to X that takes a point X and assigns the G X. So different viewpoints of the same thing. And sometimes we want to talk just about the underlying space because it turns out that we can mix up uh, methods and um, get what the phase space has to be of a certain flow with certain properties without actually understanding the action. And that group uh, that is, uh, um, the, one would say the simplest, but where this is the case is uh, the integers, um, which has this non-metrizable dynamics that I find very interesting. So just a few examples. Well, we can have finite groups as well. This is not excluded. And we can think of uh, something sort of geometric. So if I have a Z6, I can be acting on a hexagon just by rotations. And because this is one generated group and we have this rule about compositions, this is going to be generated by a single element, right? So I can just say that I am I am rotating from one vertex to another. To the, to the consecutive one and then by composition this is extended and the same thing as it has to be true of course about uh, about integers and sometimes when you say dynamics topological dynamics this is all that will be done is uh, is the dynamics of the integers so uh, s1 for me is identified with the real numbers module integers just so that we can talk about rotations by rational and irrational angles and not worry about pies and uh, how we think about it is that it is given by a single homeomorphism that corresponds to the number one that generates the whole action and we are rotating by some angle alpha. So if that alpha is uh, irrational, we call it an irrational rotation. So this is one of the most um, well-known dynamical systems. 
And another one for integers that is very well known is the Bernoulli shift. So the Bernoulli shift is an action on the Cantor space. And uh, it's again generated just by one homeomorphism and this homeomorphism is the left shift. So what happens here is that we have a pointer right in the sequence that tells us that this is the zero of coordinate and somehow we have the sequence uh, starting from there. And then if I do the shift, this is my X, then Sigma X is just going to say that uh, the zero of coordinate is now one place to the left. And then to have something uh, a little different for the group, and these are the groups that I'm working with a lot, groups of homeomorphisms here in disguise, also group of automorphisms. So this is just the group of all homeomorphisms of the Cantor space with the compact open topology and it acts naturally on the Cantor space just by evaluation. But it can also act on the Cantor space in a more complicated way, which is uh, of interest. And as I said, this is also uh, the same as a group of automorphisms of a certain structure, and here by the stone duality, the structure is the countable atomless Boolean algebra, which is the Boolean algebra of Clopen subsets of the Cantor space. So these are some dynamical systems. The important thing is that we are acting on compact spaces, which the, when you say dynamics, then usually you're talking about real dynamics and then you will not have these restrictions, but we are not heading into uh, differential equations. Okay, so what I'm studying mostly are minimal flows and um, hopefully I'll draw a good reason for that. A flow is minimal if it's minimal with respect to inclusion, that means that it doesn't contain any non-trivial proper subflow and here, because we are in compact spaces, subflow needs to be on a compact space, so on a compact subset. And uh, if I take an arbitrary point inside of a flow and I look at its orbit, so I look at all the places where it moves, and I take a closure of that, this is, of course, a closed subspace, but it's also going to be invariant. So every orbit closure is a subflow. So being minimal is the same thing as saying that every orbit has to be dense, and this is a nice property to work with. And a notorious example is the is a rotation on the unit circle by an irrational rotation. So this is a, um, something that has a lot of very nice properties, and one of them is that this is a minimal flow. And among the minimal flow, there is the most complicated one, which is called the universal minimal flow. And the universality is with respect to um, homomorphisms that go on to. So what does universality mean? It's some MG, we, we go for that phase space, but it's together with some action. And uh, we, if we have any other minimal flow, then there is a factor map. That means that there is a continuous map that goes from mg to m such that it respects the respective action so that the square commutes so in a way this is the most convoluted ones and then all of the minimal flows are going to be factors of that so for instance if you know that the uh, minimal that the universal minimal flow is metrizable then you know that all minimal flows are going to be metrizable in an extreme case if the universal minimal flow is minimal then you know that every minimal flow is minimal and then you always have fixed points under every action, right? So the reason to study minimal flows is that they always have to appear and presence of different types of minimal subflows tells you sort of how complicated your system is. And then the universal minimal flow tells you how complicated can the most complicated minimal flow be. And uh, there are some trivial examples of that. So if I have a compact group, then I have a log translation action and that is going to be the universal minimal flow. And um, of course it is minimal because it is, it is transitive and uh, um, cannot be anything bigger. So uh, there are some that are very much non-trivial. And for instance, if you look at M of this, what we could, could think the simplest uh, um, infinite group, then this is huge. This is as huge as it could potentially be by being a minimal flow. And uh, it is uh, therefore also non metrizable. So, this is something that I would like to understand, but it's not point of the talk. I will mention a little bit more um, what we know about it. 
And uh, there are some flows that are metrizable, and I will have examples of that month maybe because I was mentioning this group of homeomorphisms of uh, um, the Cantor space. So the universal minimal flow of that is metrizable and it acts on the Cantor space, but it is not the same as the evaluation action. It's a more complicated action than the, than the one by evaluation. Any questions? So a way to study minimal flows or universal minimal flow is via an ambit because we know theoretically that the universal minimal flow does exist. This is in the category of flows where we act on compact house or spaces. You can uh, use an abstract argument to, sh to say that it exists, but we don't have a very constructive way to say what it is unless it's a special case, but then it's a case by case analysis. So we will we have an ambient space in which we know it, that it lives, and that's the greatest ambit in here. So it also has a universality property, but we have a constructive way of thinking about it, and, and we know how the action looks like, and the universal minimal flows lives inside of it. So what is an ambit? Uh, it's, a, it's an orbit closure, right? So what ambit is a flow where you have a distinguished point, whose orbit is dense, right? So you can think of it as being the orbit closure of this point. And the greatest ambit is the most complicated orbit. It factors onto every other uh, ambit while mapping that base point here onto the base point here. So of course, there is uh, only one such map uh, if, if it exists uh, because both of the orbits are dense and it actually does always exist. So there is a unique map. This E is going to be the same as the identity in the group. And it turns out that this SG, the greatest ambit, is a compactification. So you can embed G onto a dense image inside and take some compactification. In this case, this is a compactification that was constructed by Samuel which is why this is called S. So it's also called Samuel's compactification and he did it more generally for um, uniform spaces. And um, um, here it is for G with um, either left or right uniformity. Am I still connected? Yes, yes, You're, uh, okay. we, we hear you. Okay, good, because I'm losing the, your videos every here and there, so I was just making sure that I'm not talking to myself. Okay. Uh, no, don't so, worry, you're still on. Okay, okay. Uh, so, as I said, we study this because we know that MG lives outside of SG and dynamically we recognize it as being, uh, min being a minimal subflow of, of SG, so all of those are going to be isomorphic. So now how, the, how can these objects look like? And um, I was thinking that in um, this seminar, the best would be to start with countable discrete groups because there is a, a, a nice description of that via ultra filters. So if I have a countable discrete group, although you can forget the countable in here, then you take the stone check compactification. I said it, check stone compactification, <laughs> um, losing my roots that is the space of all ultra filters on G with the usual topology. So, but let me remind you what the usual topology is. Uh, for every subset of G, we have a clopen subset of beta G, which is given by all the ultra filters that contain that set. Okay, so this is a basic clopen set. And we can also think of beta G as the stone space of the Boolean algebra power set of G. So I like to think about these objects in terms of Boolean algebras and it turned out to be productive, um, at least in part of this uh, area. And of course, this is a compactification where we identify G with uh, the principal ultra filters. And this is also a graded ambit and we, I, we define the action in the most natural way. You take an ultra filter, you take an element of the group, and you just translate every element of that ultra filter by that element of the group. 
So this is going to be uh, an action, and this is the greatest ambit action, which is very easy to show by the universality property of the checkstone compactification. Um, so this is reminder how the uh, what the, what the property is of being the greatest ambit. But we know that um, every every uh, map uh, into a compact space from G to X, which we can think by evaluation here, extends to beta G, and this is gonna do the job. Uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, here is Alberto. My my camera is not working, but uh, I I can maybe ask a question. This ambit needs also a point, right? It's a, it's a pointed action. Uh... Mm -hmm. That's right. So. so it's... Mm -hmm. So what's the point? I mean, it's uh, if the point should be an element of beta G, right? Uh, or I'm lost, uh, maybe. I don't... Yes, no, no, you're right. So this is uh, we take the identity in G, and we take the um, the principal ultra filter that is generated by E. So all okay, stuff. thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. So this is the case always for S of G. It's not always the checkstone compactification. Checkstone compactification is compactification with respect to all continuous maps into compact spaces. And uh, the Samuel compactification is a compactification with respect to all uh, uniformly continuous maps with respect to the left uniformity on the group. So it's a similar um, type of compactification, but they co coincide for discrete groups because of course every continuous function is uniformly continuous for discrete groups. So it's always going to be the case that the identity in the group uh, can be identified with the base point of the greatest ambit. So what is oh, so what is the universal minimal flow uh, for countable discrete groups? So there is some good news and some bad news. So as we said, uh, the universal minimal flow is a minimal subflow of beta G, and that's where um, mostly this is work of Balsar Franek, preceded by some results with Turek, and then getting this full generality, which concerns what should be put in here, was finished very recently as a side product of Glass and Sankov, Weiss and Zucker. But the point is that now we have to step away from uh, the ambition to understand the action, but we understand where that universal minimal flow lives. So if I take an arbitrary countable discrete group, then the universal minimal flow is going to live on a given space, which is the Gleason cover of the Cantor cube of weight continuum. And the Gleason cover is, the um, um, well, there is a topological version, the one that was used in the proof is that this is the stone space of the regular open algebra of uh, the of this Cantor cube. So think of the free algebra on uh, continuum many generators and take the free completion and then take the stone space. So this is the um, the algebra that we are talking about. So in particular, such a space has to be extremely disconnected. And it's as huge as it could be for still being a minimal flow for a countable discrete group. Um, but we still do not understand how the action works. Some people are I think, not interested, the ones that are leaders in topological dynamics, and some people say that it's extremely difficult because of course the universal minimal flow factors onto every minimal flow and then just studying minimal subflows on, over the Bernoulli shift, which is a metrizable flow, is extremely difficult and still being done. So in a way, one would have to understand all minimal subflows of the Bernoulli shift if we want to use the description that Baltar and Franek abstractly did that, to obtain this result. So, but I don't give up. I, I um, have some ideas, so let's hope that this time it works out. So uh, another question, another question I am um, interrupting mm -hmm. you. Um, hey. So the, 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 the phase space is always the same, no matter what G is, right? Correct. Okay, so, but, but obviously we expect uh, the universal minimal action to depend on G. Right, you could have torsion, no torsion, right? Different number of So different, different groups will act in a different way on the very same space. Exactly. 
Okay. This just tells us that it that there is no hope, for instance, for it to be somewhat small, that it would and um how much the, the space helps, it is not clear because we will see that it it is more of a rule that these spaces are the same in some category of groups. Well, well, the rule is um, that's what I'm trying to expand to try to understand how the face spaces can look like and if we are lucky, we also get the action or not. Here, however, we have it at least for a very large class of groups, whereas um, in some other cases, we know abstractly that it would have to be some space, but to know which groups have that space as the universal minimum flow, we have to go case by case. So I'm getting to that right now. So as we said, for G-Compact, we know that it's going to be the, the universal minimum flow is just the group itself with the left translation. So we know everything. So we usually discard that as no, not, in, not interesting because there is nothing to do. Uh, however, there has been a lot of effort in understanding uh, groups which have the universal minimal flow manageable, that is metrizable. So you don't even have to consider non-metrizable ones and you know all of the minimal flows. And this was done especially for groups of automorphisms of uh, countable first order structures. So there were some preliminary results where the main um, interest was in other problems as it usually comes. And this was a side product. So we will have some examples of that later on. But to point out the parallel with what was for discrete groups, if it happens that an automorphism group has a uh, metrizable universal minimal flow, then its phase space has to be either really small, that is finite, or it has to act on the Cantor space. This is not difficult to prove, right? There is not that many uh, compact. We know it's zero dimensional. It has to be compact and it cannot have any isolated points. So, uh, the problem is that we don't know in terms of topological groups, how to determine which group ha groups have universal minimum, universal minimum flow metrizable. So what happens in here is that you have a certain structure you prove which is countable, ultra homogeneous, and you look at its finite approximations or finitely generated. You prove some Ramsey's theorem for that, and then you get uh, explicitly computed universal minimal flow, which will be the Cantor set typically with the action. So um, it's case by case. So one of the big um, goals in this area, if it's manageable, would be to understand what type of groups give you this. Right? And that would in turn give you proofs of Ramsey theorems, purely combinatorial things uh, via topological dynamics, because this is actually an equivalence, the uh, presence of Ramsey's theorem and the metrizability of the universal minimum flow. So I know that some people here are working towards that as well. So some examples when this happens, because uh, this looks like a much nicer situation, and it turns out that it's not um, it's not so uncommon as it seems to be, but it appears only in groups that are so-called um, infinite dimensional, which just means not locally compact, but in topological dynamics, locally compact used to be the groups that were studied the most. So that's why this was not really present before and um, is considered a new, new line of research. But there are some all the results so um, mg can be trivial it can be just one point and that means that whenever this group acts continuously on a compact house door space it has a, a fixed point so in 84 uh, there was a result with concentration of measure uh, that the group of unitaries of the infinite dimensional separable Hilbert space is extremely amenable uh, so concentration of measure is a Ramsey type phenomenon, so it's not off from what I said before, but this is obviously not uh, a discrete structure. So this can be rephrased in terms of continuous Ramsey theory, so it's still in the same world. Uh, then in 98, Festov showed that the group of automorphisms of the dense linear order without endpoints uh, has extremely amenable group of automorphisms, and here he used the classical Ramsey's theorem for finite sets. Uh, then he proved that um, the group of isometries of the uh, Eurizon space, the separable one, um, has extremely amenable group. But 
it doesn't really matter how large these objects are. That's one thing that uh, um, the focus has been mostly on countable or separable structures, but that's not really important. It's the structure of the group and local behavior rather than size. And uh, that was proved again con by concentration of measure, and we can also use Ramsey theorem for um, finite metric spaces. And then we proved that the group of isometries of the Gurari space, linear isometry, is extremely amenable, and we encoded that into the dual Ramsey theorem, and there is many more, but each of them has a Ramsey result behind that is proof case by case, uh, and there is no, um, there is being developed a general machinery, but it's certainly complicated. Uh, so I put these examples just so that we see different types of groups that that have been studied so that it's not it's not just, for instance, the groups of automorphisms of uh, discrete structures. Uh, and then um, it's even harder. The extreme amenability really has this Ramsey uh, Ramsey counterpart also in continuous logic. However, when we go to computation of the universal minimal flow, then we need Ramsey expansions and Ramsey degrees which we don't understand quite yet in the continuous setting so that's why there is more of the discrete um discrete structure so if we take the group of all permutations on natural numbers then glasner and weiss show that this has um uh, as universal minimal flow the all linear orders uh, on natural numbers with just translating that linear order by permutations and then they also showed uh, and that that also depends on just Ramsey's theorem for finite sets, the group of homeomorphisms of the Cantor space, that being the group of automorphisms of the counter bottomless Boolean algebra. This corresponds, this computation is done by um, the Ramsey, the dual Ramsey theorem, which we can think of the Ramsey theorem for Boolean algebras, for finite Boolean algebras, and many more where we do have the presence of Ramsey's theorem either from the past, from combinatorics, or people who are actively working in this area are classifying countable structures that have uh, finite substructures with the Ramsey property. So this is what has been done a lot recently. So I would like to understand the opposite side where we do not have metrizable universal minimal flows, but um, that's to come. Let me say some good news. So today I'm talking about algebraic structure and uh, its interactions with universal minimal flows. And uh, sort of when I was um, sort of wrapping at this project, I learned about the result from Gianluca and Andy Zucker, uh, where they showed that if you look at a product of two topological groups with metrizable universal minimal flows, then a natural action on the product of the universal minimal flows is going to be the universal minimal. Their results are, of course, there is this is more general and there is many more, but in this uh, for this talk, this is a show of something that works. And if uh, you know, please, uh, Jan, look, I you know, you have more to say, let me know because I'm sure that there might be more since then because I know you are also working on the extensions. So, uh, so now what are the classes, right? Of topological groups, I have this dream that really infinite dimensional, locally compact, discrete is a part of one picture where we can uniformly look at those. So, um moving from okay for all countable discrete groups we know universal minimal flow lives on the same space so i use that as a black box uh, and uh, from that i look at locally compact groups which often have some discreteness in it and we will see what i'm um, some examples of that so for locally compact groups we know that the universal minimal flows are non-metrizable this is a combination of Beach's theorem that says that uh, locally compact groups act freely on universal minimal flows and Kekristos of Todorcevich used that to show that it has to be non metrizable So indeed, again, um, um, another reason they are close to discrete groups. And there's a motivation, uh, which is a structure theorem for a class of locally compact groups. So these are groups that are automorphism groups of countable first order structures that are locally compact. And uh, those topologically are boring. Well, groups of automorphisms in general are so here it's either finite set or countably infinite set or the Cantor space or a combination of these two just the product however we've seen that the phase spaces of universal minimal flows can be boring as well so the question is 
do we get a translation here? Does it mean that every such group has the corresponding universal minimum flow that is uh, the, a finite set because that's compact, the universal minimum flow of a discrete group or semi-group does the same, or the Cantor space, again, this is compact, right? Or a product of these two things. So I set two classes of groups uh, in two different, the same class of groups in a different way. This is, I, I thought, uh, the locally compact uh, groups of automorphisms would be immediately understood. And these are exactly all Polish, this totally disconnected locally compact groups. So you don't have to go to the structures at all. And this is what is very different from the infinite dimensional groups. We don't go to the structure of the group of the underlying um, to the underlying structure whose automorphism group it is. We use uh, methods that are more common in totally disconnected locally compact groups. So this is what I would like to show. And um, partially, I know this is true in somewhat, you know, the easier case, of course, it's a, uh, it's true when I have any, uh, if I have an open compact normal subgroup. So in particular, abelian groups of this sort. So I can do better. It doesn't have to be uh, a group of automorphisms, which is totally disconnected, right? So I don't need the total disconnectedness, but this was a, a motivation. What is more important for me is that being close to abelian, that's what plays a role. Okay, so group extensions are very often used in, in locally compact groups to understand more complicated ones out of pieces that are less complicated. And of course, the most, uh, um, the, the easiest way is when a group is a product of two groups or a semi-direct product and more general is, is a short exact sequence, which that is not always possible to, to rewrite it as a semi-direct product. So um, short exact sequence says that uh, we have this group that, well, the maps here are continuous open group homomorphisms, right? And we have an injection here and we have a surjection here, which I will call pi and uh, all these compositions uh, um, are um, right. Yeah, they they match. So that that that's what gives you that you have an injection and then you have a surjection, right? So, uh, so we can also assume that K is a normal subgroup, right? And it's a kernel of pi. You want the composition to be trivial, and uh, therefore we have that H has to be isomorphic as a topological group, so topologically isomorphic and homeomorphic to the quotient. So we can we can um, interchange these two. And an example um, that is not okay. Oh, I forget in here. So the the situation where we can write G as a semi-direct product is uh, exactly the same as uh, having splitting, right? So I have this pi that goes onto the quotient, and if I can go back, I can take a selector that gives me a, a group, then I can write this as a semi-direct product, right? Um, and I will work with splittings that however do not have to be, well, selectors that do not have to really be splittings, they don't have to go on groups. So this will appear, um, and this is the, the nicest case that we can get. So for instance, this is also a very known, well-known uh, splitting sequence. We can um, we have of course embedded special linear group into the general linear group, and then we can go down here by determinant, and then we can go back by assigning to every non-zero R the matrix that has R here, one here, and zeros everywhere here, and then the action in the semi-direct product is by conjugation. So this is, for instance, one that I'm interested in and that we don't know yet, because we will be looking at some special case of, uh, of, of uh, these sequences. Uh, so the groups that we will be looking at are generalizations of abelian groups, and the generalization is SIN, which, is, which goes for small invariant neighborhoods, invariant with respect to conjugation, right? So it has um, 
it has a basis of open neighborhoods such that if you conjugate those neighborhoods they stay the same and it is the same thing as saying that the left and right uniformities coincide so you can switch up sort of sides for um in a in a uniformly continuous way in multiplication so what the result is uh so we have a sequence a short exact sequence and we want the group here for now to be compact so this is some um, first instance when one of the factors is compact let's have it now on the left and we want it to act freely just so that this even makes sense right we want to take these this this k will be orbits of k on m of g so they all have to be k for this to make sense but in locally compact groups this is not really a restriction because g acts freely itself on m of g so k is of course going to act freely so of course, I would like to know about more applications, but this is this comes out for free in the class that I'm really studying. And then what I need is that I do have some sort of splitting, but it doesn't have to be a splitting of groups. So it doesn't have to be homeomorphism. It is just a continuous cross section. So I was so proud of coming up with these things. And then I realized, of course, people have been studying these for like 100 years. So, uh, but... <laughs> I'm glad that I found out that they were studying them also for the groups I was interested in because they're not so easy to come across, unfortunately. So I need it to be uniformly continuous, which it's fine in, in the groups of automorphisms. And a cross section is what you would think, right? It's, it's a selector. It just means that it selects from every coset one element. And then either uh, G has... Um, pi goes from G to H, right? In the... Um... Yes, 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 yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was more focused on trying to put it on top of the arrow and then I which arrow I was putting it on. Definitely. And then I am using this generalized version of abelian for correcting that this S is not a homomorphism. So if it's a homomorphism, then I don't need that. If it's a homomorphism, then I then I use that. Okay, so you know we would like to, of course, remove some of these conditions, but for now this is this is what it is. This uniform continuity, one cannot really think that you can remove it, but maybe you can just look at a little different ways of splitting. Okay, so some examples. Uh, so Sorry, uh, Dana, can I can I can I ask something? Uh, the how how does this how does your theorem relate to the uh, Basel Zucker uh, theorem? Do, can you, I'm, so, it's, it's not entirely clear to me. Is there is there anything? Uh, is there any so, relation between the right. two? So what a counterpart to it in a way of what uh, class of groups we are working in, but from what I saw in the proof, it's very much the same in a way. Of course, it is different uh, because, you know, in the end, things are different. But what they do is that they have also a short exact sequence. But if I'm not wrong, Jan Luca, you still have just the products. Or did you manage to get, uh, if you just have short exact sequence? Yeah, I think it's the uh, the computation of the universal normal, of the universal normal flow of the products is only for the products, not for the um, exact okay. sequence. So, so what they do, so now K is just a... Uh, um, a group with metrizable universal minimum flow and they look at uh, orbits of that like so so uh, uh, on the universal minimum flow of g so you have that g is equal to k times h right and you can take you can look at k orbits on m of g well for me k orbits are really subflows because they are closed right because k is compact for them it's not right so you have to take closures but uh, by something that uh, um, I showed with Andy and Andy then uh, improved with Colan, um, this is going to um, be enough so that when you take the uh, sort of quotient by this, this is actually going to be a universal minimum flow for H. So this, in a way, it was very funny when I saw the talk because it was somewhat so similar, of course. The reason why it works is different because of different class of groups, but the the, the idea is not um, so so off. So I'm hoping that will also combine well, and that there should their work should certainly go for the short exact sequences, right? Not just for products. And uh, one would think somewhat there is a different reason, and I like that they did it this way, right? We know that at least for the metrizability. 
or the analogs in higher cardinality, you have the underlying Ramsey reason, right? And Ramsey theorems are productive. So somehow you could go in that vein and that's something to keep in mind, right? But this is a neat uh, dynamical way to see that. And this is exactly what we like to see the correspondence in there. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. No, this is a great question and uh, uh, it's, um, it should be explored further to see why uh, that these two ends, these two extremes are really not all that different. But of course, it is, uh, and um, uh, that's certainly something that I would like to mention is that uh, you cannot make this too general, right? So for me, I have this restriction that K has to be compact H can be anything. You could want to wonder other things. Well, I can also have H to be compact and K not, right? So, but I still have this one compact factor, right? So what I'm trying to do is what I think everybody believes that you can take a compact factor out. If you have normal group or a quotient, then that there is a natural way to do it. If you just have a compact subgroup that somehow gives you decomposition, then this is harder, but we are working on that with a student of mine. So, but the idea is that when you have a nice compact piece, you should be able to somehow get it out. So that's what we are trying to do. Well, you would like to think, and, and then it's nice that the, the productivity works for universal minimal flows. It, when they are metrizable, it fails terribly anywhere else. So I want to mention the uh, case of Z squared where it fails as badly as you could imagine. And that's what I'm working on with Ola Kwiatkowska. This, um, it's, it's hard. People always say like, oh, it's hard. <laughs> I'm like, well, let's hope that we'll get something out of it, but it's, it's slow for sure. Uh, so just where I started really was the ones that were totally disconnected, where I have a basis of open subgroups. So in here, open compact subgroups, right? When they're locally compact. So now if I have a subgroup that is normal, among these, then uh, then I get that the quotient is going to be discrete, and then selector maps are always uniformly continuous, right? I mean, arbitrary selector because of the discreteness. Uh, so I do get this uh, this result. So if I have um, a um, small invariant neighborhood group of automorphisms that is locally compact, then I can always do the splitting because the uniformly continuous section cross section is for free. So it was. Uh, that sort of came out from trying to generalize it to things that are not totally disconnected. And then, uh, then I found this result of Kehris and Sokic, where they were looking at the semi-direct products on really both sides. So you can have one, one side is compact, the other one is not, and then you just put the M to the appropriate place. But uh, there you get um, uh, also uh, an isomorphism. So they did it for metrizable, but it works for non-metrizable as well. Okay, so these are some, some something to make it worthwhile. And this is one thing that I wanted to point out again, because I think that we're in a logic seminar that people might care about understanding these flows in terms of filters. So we said that for the discrete group, the greatest ambit is just the space of all ultra filters. And then the universal minimal flow was the, the, the characterization, abstract characterization was done by looking at it as a subspace of the greatest ambit. So we do the same here as well. We basically prove the result for the greatest ambit and then go down to the universal minimal flow. And here the greatest ambit uh, on an arbitrary topological group can be actually uh, described in terms of filters on, on G. So now I put draw here because it's so much easier to draw and I'm very bad at it still on the computer after all these years. So we had the universal um, action, right? Universal ambit action. But we want to understand it in terms of filters. So we actually go to the beta of the discrete group. So if I have the group discrete, right, then I can go to, then this is the greatest ambit. But of course, uh, if I'm if I'm putting topology, I'm putting more restrictions. So then the SG is still remains an ambit for the discrete group. So there is a quotient morphism that is natural. This is just given by uh, being the greatest ambit for the discrete one. 
And Samuel, in, in his paper, in his thesis in 48, he described exactly how this quotient looks like. It was more in general in metrizable spaces or in uniform spaces. Uh, but I'll just say for the groups. So we will say that the two filters, U and V, are going to be in this equivalence relation, right? And so these are filters on, on the, just, just arbitrary ultra filters on G. G if, um, well, their envelopes are the same. So these are Samuel envelopes and he called them this. And what is this? Well, I take my ultra filter U and I, I sort of uh, zoom out modulo the topology, right? So points are not points anymore, right? They are neighborhoods. So I just do um, now W A such that A is in U and W is in the neighborhood uh, filter of the identity. And I close it up, right? So this gives me a filter base. I close it up. This is going to give me some closed subset of the uh, of the checksum compactification. And this gives me the partition that corresponds to this quotient map, right? So I can work with these equivalence classes of ultra filters, which are these filters, and they're actually not bad to work with. So this is something that I use a lot. And for instance, what is interesting here is that I don't know how to avoid it. So most of the proofs that I have in that paper on, on this subject are just dynamical. Eventually, they were all ultra filters and then uh, I found out that I can do them dynamically except for one place so um, I very much believe in this method and I know that Andy has done a lot of work with this as well that was not done before so um, that's one thing that I would like to promote that you can view these flows in terms of filters and you can work with boolean algebras because usually when you prove these results for uh, these totally disconnected groups then you can just sort of, you know, you can throw in the epsilons and it works out still. So in a way, uh, you could certainly use Boolean algebraic methods in there. So let me see where the where it is used. So I'll just do, go to this slide and then I say what is and what is not possible, right? So uh, as I said, we proved this result for the uh, for the greatest ambit, uh, and we we have then in the formula the the greatest ambit for the quotient and this is just dynamical identification that uh, i can think of that as uh, the quotient space uh, as of orbits of uh, the action of k right so i take orbits of k these are my equivalence classes in here and it turns out that this is the same so i'm really working with this guy and i think this is very similar to what Gianluca and andy did and uh, uh, then the crucial part is that I need to take this cross section that I need the uniform continuity to be able to extend to this thing because as G is exactly given by being the place where I can extend uniformly continuous functions. But to show that it is a cross section, I use these filters to show that I really land in a cross section. So it's um, there probably is a dynamical proof, but. Uh, the, uh, the filters are the things that allow me to prove things and then maybe I, I reprove them in a different way. Uh, so um, that's basically, um, you know, that's what I wanted to present here for, uh, for where this is used. And then this, uh, if, if this case is free, then really these orbits can be identified with K and I do get the product result. Okay, so then, uh, there is this interesting part where I, that's where I need the, this, uh, the left and right uniformities to be the same because I need the greatest ambit, which is the compactification with uniform maps to be the same on both sides. So I have the greatest ambit uh, working as a left ambit and right ambit at the same time, because if my splitting here is not a homomorphism, I somehow have to make up for it to not being a homomorphism, which I do with a cycle. And when you do a cycle, you have to switch sides. So you sort of have to, you know, you, you have some sort of conjugation, but you do not have any conjugation defined in SG, right? If, if it was just a group, you would just do conjugation. You cannot do it here. So, uh, so that's what we do here. So I'll just show how ugly it is, right? It looks ugly, but it turns out it's the 
usual thing that one would do in in discrete or uniform of or locally compact dynamics to use this um this is the correction for uh not being a group homomorphism sort of like choosing the thing that would be your one but it is not so you have to you know match it so or your you know the um the sender sort of of that um copy of k okay so i didn't mean to say more about the proof i just wanted to point out these two things right where i needed the thin and uh, where i needed the near ultra filters um so the splitting is in a way a weak point not for the groups of automorphisms but in general if you want to study something uh something more general and also you often do not get well maybe you get the group to be normal but you could get a, a very natural compact group where you have some sort of splitting but the group is not normal so it cannot be written in this language so let me maybe point out a few things that one could maybe do or what we are trying to do in here so first of all there is nice decomposition theorem for all sin groups this is this goes back there is like there's a lot of uh, structure theory for locally compact groups. So basically you could take a hundred page paper, which I guess I should do at some moment or find a student who wants to do it and go through the properties of locally compact groups. This is very well understood and it fits very well what we are trying to do. But uh, it turns out that same groups are always uh, group extensions of uh, what they call a vector group, which is just R to the N times compact with a discrete group, right? So, uh, you know, you can take this as a black box and maybe you can somehow, you know, uh, uh, we, we know actually how to compute R to the N, the universal minimal flow, and then uh, you have this compact piece that you can take out. So, you know, but still, we don't know how to do discrete, uh, discrete uh, and R on one side and the other, which I will mention. Uh, it, that really goes to Z squared. Uh, but this, this is where one where I would look if I would like to understand all locally compact sync groups, right? Like we don't have the splitting here and this is not really compact, but maybe we can put this somehow on this side. This would not be as much problem. The splitting is a problem and you have a lot of theory about the splittings and they don't, the cross sections, they are not so easy to come up with. And even less, they are uniformly continuous, right? They are uh, usually going to be uh, continuous where you are using something for compact sets where you get uniformly continuous, but your group would be sigma compact if you're lucky. And so there is a lot of sort of more analytic work in there. And then what if there is no cross section and there are different reasons why there could be no cross sections. I'll show you two reasons. Uh, one of them would be not being normal. So there is really not, um, you you don't even have a group on the other side so you have to do something a little different and uh what if k uh what if k is not compact so this is certainly um a problem any questions so if k is not compact i just mentioned before right that if g of g mod k is compact and we do have cross section then we are okay as well. So um, yeah. compact on either side of the short exact sequence. But what if we don't have a short exact sequence, right? So one thing that I said that we do have is uh, R, and uh, that was done by Turek, and it uses a black box. Um, so I'll say maybe what the result is, and then I just say why the splitting doesn't work in here, even though we have a nice short exact sequence. So you imagine uh, the real line as being split into close intervals. And because they are closed, you have to glue them, right? So this H is the equivalence relation that always uh, connects the one of one interval and zero of the consecutive interval. And it turns out that this carries to the greatest bandwidth and to the universal minimal flow. So you go to, you know, beta Z times unit interval, then you have this action, of course, of this guy, and then the equivalence relation works out nicely. Um, so that works out. And I had my, this is an undergraduate student who verified that this actually works for going to R to the N. And you can do the same identification, right? You take the cubes and then you just have to be more careful when you're verifying things because you're gluing more, right? You're gluing things on the, on the boundary. Uh, but it does work out as well. And uh, description of the greatest ambit using filters is crucial there. That's that's how the proof goes. So it's another 
place where you see that, then you would think like, okay, but integers, they are a nice uh, discrete lattice, what we call lattice in, in locally compact group, right? And it has a nice quotient, which is compact, right? So why cannot we do that? Well, this is a circle. How do you get circle back inside of, of integers, right? So what you're doing is really, you're doing the, um, the universal cover of of Z, uh, of sorry of of, uh, of S one rather than selection, right? But you are almost selecting, right? If you had this instead of S one, then you could just embed it onto an interval, and that would work as a selector of the cosets, right? So uh, when you know the the only problem for not having a selector is in a boundary that we understand clearly, then maybe we can do something, right? So that would be another class of groups to extend it. Uh, in general, when you have such a situation where you have a compact group and that can be more general and you have a discrete group in here, then we call these um, groups, locally compact groups with uh, uh, lattices. So these are called lattices and these are, um, you know, the, the call them lattices when the quotient is compact. And then this guy would be called fundamental domain because we can just glue these together according to to the discrete subgroup. Uh, another uh, group that one can attack by that would be the SL groups. Uh, we are working on SL2R now, where you have different types of lattices. You have algebraic lattice, SL2Z, and you also have um, a lattice, which is uh, by hyperbolic triangles. So that's uh, something that I'm much more a fan of, but it somehow looks a lot more like the cubes because you are looking at, you know, like doing reflections along the hyperbolic edges. Um, so that sounds like an exciting thing to do because I want to say hyperbolic in my talk. So it's, uh, but, but seriously, it seems like just, um, you know, we can do something there and uh, uh, if we don't do it, nobody else will, I'm afraid. Uh, so the, this uh, seems like a very nice, uh, nice place to to go beyond where we do not have a normal subgroup, right? We have a compact group, but that is not normal, which is this, uh, the orthogonal subgroup in here, right? Um, so we cannot quotient by it, right? But we, but we almost can modulo these boundaries. So you just forget about short exact sequences and have almost short exact sequences. And this is the last thing I promised. So this is uh, why we cannot just do products or why we cannot replace this compact group by anything or why the metrizability plays some role. Uh, well, metrizable ones are really very different topologically, right? There is very different structure in the greatest ambit and that's what uh, Gianluca and Andy are using. So the first place, right, one would look for counterexamples to naive conjectures is Z squared. So we can look at um, just the projections, right, on the co coordinates. So here, this really gives you just the identity. But then when you are lifting it to beta, then it matters, right? So you have the pi one that goes in here. So you take an ultra filter on the square and you just project uh, onto one coordinate and onto the other coordinate, and that gives you ultra filters. So, of course, the first thing would be like, okay, is this um, an isomorphism? Are these the same thing? Any idea? Any guess? They are not, right? So, first thing is that uh, this is not even extremely disconnected. This, uh, you know, this has the uh, Boolean algebra of cloak and set, the whole algebra, power set algebra, which is. Uh, uh, complete, whereas here this is a free product of two algebras and this is never complete. So it cannot be. But now, how bad is it, right? So there are some fun results that happen, which I hope fortunately do not have to deal with it. And that is that uh, these this map can act weirdly. Uh, and um, mostly they act weirdly on P points and selective ultra filters. So you can have pairs. In, uh, in beta Z that will have finite free images if you have P points. So if you have P points, if you have also uh, P points um, um, rooting keys below um, your, your images, then the free images can be finite. But typically they are infinite and they are infinite if you have idempotence. So this is okay, I didn't talk about the group structure. 
and uh, they are infinite in minimal subflows, which is what, what interests us. But now where do they live? So what we are really interested in is now how this map relativizes to some minimal subflow, right? So that gives you still naturally a map into the product of a, a minimal subflows. And here you don't have to worry about anything. So this doesn't give you that because you don't know where those live. They could live in different uh, minimal subflows, for instance, and that does happen, right? So you will, you have different subflows, minimal subflows, they are all isomorphic, and these pre-images, if you're looking in all beta, are going to also cross a lot of the minimal subflows, but when you look at just one minimal subflow, you will still have infinite pre-images. But it's really not easy to work with this. It's it's gotten very interested and interesting and frustrating. We use some very heavy results by Zelenyuk about the structure of the Czechstone compactification in the dynamical way. So um, it's satisfactory because that's what we wanted to prove, and very unsatisfactory after knowing so little after we actually proved it. So it's. Uh, but I find it very interesting. It really goes down to understanding ultra filters in beta and um, understanding the ultra filters that go into here, which consist of sets that are called synthetic, which are somewhat combinatorially very interesting. They come from dynamics, but in Z, they just mean that they have finite gaps. So they are also studied a lot in the Bernoulli systems, but trying to understand them in Z cross Z is. Um, with respect to that has been really fun and not going very far. But, um, so if this this is something that uh, I find super entertaining. Well, anyway, thank you so much for your time, for your attention and for the invitation. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dana. Uh, let's all thank Dana with the, the funny little uh, uh, hands on the on the screen. And um, so, are there any any questions for for Dana? I have a possibly dumb question. Um, so, what you said about synth groups um, does it hold also for non locally complex synth groups? No. Are those so, things? Or yeah, like the classification. Or my results? Your results, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, integers are sin, right? So you really, you know, Z squared is sin. So the yeah. local components for now. So, okay, no, no, I, I see what you're asking. Sorry. Yes, yes. So local compact is not important at all. Uh, in if, if, if the K is compact, right. So if you still restrict your attention to a compact subgroup, then the local compactness is not necessary. Then the condition that K acts freely becomes non-trivial. So you have to look into that. And then I was hoping, well, maybe if a K, a K does not act freely, it still acts somewhat uniformly, but it does not have to. The orbits of K can be all over the place, so you cannot take a, take a product with something. Maybe you could still have some Restrictions on how how the space of k orbits can look like, or how the k orbits can be and glue them together, but the freeness then becomes a little becomes non-trivial condition. But this um, the, the fact that semi-compatification is both a right and left. Um, that's right. Yeah. Flow. That's okay. But that's yeah, hard to use. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, is there another question for Dana? Well, if not, then uh, let's uh, thank her uh, again. So thanks a lot, Dana. And uh, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll meet uh, again uh, for the <clears throat> Torino Udine seminar uh, ne next week for Michael Pinska from Vienna and uh, for a subject that has yet to be announced. Thanks everyone and have a nice weekend. Thank you so much for the invite. This was really awesome.
Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dana.